Welcome to Idea the IPO. My name is Rob. I organize Idea the IPO. We've been holding events in Silicon Valley for many, many years. We launched officially on February 1st, 2010. At that time, we had no members and no events on our calendar. At this stage, we have over 100,000 members among all our meetup groups all around the world. We've organized, promoted, and produced over 2,357 events. By any standard, by any measure, we're the most active, most prolific startup event organization in the history of Silicon Valley, bar none. We hold venture capital panels, legal workshops, networking events, and more. These days, we're 100% online. We have an event nearly every day of the week. Check out our schedule at idea to IPO.com. Our featured speaker tonight is one of the top startup and venture capital attorneys in Silicon Valley. And he is passionate about helping entrepreneurs succeed. Ladies and gentlemen, Roger Royce. Roger, take it away. Hey, thanks very much, Rob. And thank you, all of you who have joined us from around the world here on, on this Tuesday evening. I, I see you've taken a break from watching the Democratic National Convention to come in and watch me. So thanks for doing that, I appreciate that. Uh, we've got a really good program tonight on how to negotiate with venture capitalists. You're gonna hear things here that I think you've probably never heard before um, about negotiating with VCs. Now, before we get started, uh, I'd like to know who's in the audience. So I'm gonna launch a poll and um, We'll leave it open for a little bit, but while I'm talking, why don't you go ahead and take that poll. Let's see who's here. Uh, who do we have? Do we have investors? Do we have entrepreneurs? Do we have service providers like me? You can choose more than one answer. So I wanna thank ID at IPO for hosting this event. I'm your speaker tonight. I do this frequently. Um, and oftentimes it's panels, oftentimes it's presentations. Uh, we've done past presentations on troubled companies, on startup basics, on legal mistakes for companies. We've got some really good programs coming up in the future. So before we get started today, um, I'd like to tell you about some of the programs that are coming up. Uh, next week, August 25th, we've got a panel, a panel of venture capitalists on insurance tech, insure tech. Believe it or not, that is a thing. So uh, tune in and you'll hear me moderate a panel of venture capitalists on insurance tech. Uh, the week after that, on September 1, we have a panel for international startups. I know that a lot of you are coming to us from around the world, and I spend most of my time dealing with companies coming into Silicon Valley from someplace else. So we're doing a special presentation on considerations for startup companies from other countries that want to come into California, into Silicon Valley, and into the United States. International startups tune in on September 1. So for tonight, uh, again, our program is how to negotiate with venture capitalists. I want to go through a couple of uh, items before we get started. First of all, this program is being recorded. You can watch it later. If there's something you missed, something you like, something you didn't like, you can find it on the Idea to IPO YouTube site. You can also find it on my personal YouTube site under Roger Royce or Royce Law Firm uh, YouTube site. You can look at the recording. Um, you can also access the slides. If you send me an email, I will send you the slides as well. If you contact Rob, we'll get you the slides uh, if you'd like to refer to them. Uh, I have a ton of content. Most of it is new. Um, so uh, feel free to reach out to me for the slides. Now we're going to, I'm going to talk for an hour and then we're going to have a Q&A session for a half hour. If you've got questions, what you do is you type them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Uh, don't use the chat for that. Use the chat if there's something I need to know immediately. Like you can't hear me, you can't see me, something like that. If it's a question, a substantive question, put it in the Q&A box. I'm gonna take them all at the end of the session. Um, again, uh, my name is Roger Royce. I'm a partner with Haynes Moon, the international AMLAW 100 law firm. I work with emerging growth and venture capital, and I'm here in Silicon Valley and Palo Alto where it's hot and smoky today, by the way. In case any of you are wondering, you can't drive down, down, you can't drive downtown Palo Alto without seeing smoke from the forest fires that have now started this afternoon up in the Santa Cruz Mountains. You heard it here first. All right, so I am going to share my screen. Uh, wait, hold on a second. I'm going to share my screen. 
And if you don't see my screen, chat me. All right, here we go. Second. Awesome. How to negotiate with venture capitalists. Uh, first of all, uh, standard disclaimer, uh, this is not legal advice, of course, this is um, just me talking. Okay, venture capital. I practice in Palo Alto, Silicon Valley, California. It's where half the venture capital in this area, certainly in, in, in the San Francisco Bay Area, probably half the venture capital in the world uh, or in the country at least gets invested. Screen is not showing. Okay, hold on. How about now? You all see my screen now? All right, awesome, that must be a yes. All right, talking about venture capital. So uh, let's just get right to it. So I want to let you know that despite what's been going on in the world and what you might have heard, um, the venture capital market is still strong, right? There's still a lot of money. And these, these are the latest uh, figures that I could get from the Pricewaterhouse uh, CB Insights money tree, uh, which shows that venture is, is down a little bit. Um, but, um, well, I'm going to show you why it's down in a minute. But you can see we're still pretty strong, right? It's about the same as it was in Q1 of, of, of the of this year and stronger than it was the last quarter of last year in terms of, of deal activity. All right, so let's drill down a little bit on that. Um, the financing pace is, is short of 2019 because 2019 uh, was a pretty big year, but we're still at pretty high levels. If you look historically, look at where we are in terms of venture deals and venture money. That's, this is the, the investments and this is the number of deals you can see that we're on track to have another big year. It won't be as big as last year, but it's still gonna be pretty darn big. It's still big enough where the VCs are spending money. That's the moral of the story. It's still out there. This is not 2008. VCs have not packed their bags and gone home. So if you're on track to be a venture co uh, funded company, you're in the right year, all right? Don't think that you're not. Um, funding's a little bit less this year than the first half of 2019. Uh, but again, nevertheless, pretty darn close, right? Pretty darn close, as you can see, to, to last year. And let's see if I've got any more. Yeah, one more uh, seed deals. I'm imagining there's a lot of companies in the audience that are seed stage, um, and we've seen a rise here in Q2 after a big decline in Q1. I think that's scared. We did a lot of panels, and I heard a lot of VCs say that they were going to sit back and wait. A lot of angel funds, a lot of seed funds. We're going to talk about what that means here tonight. But we heard a lot of them say in our panels, we're going to sit back and wait for valuations to fall. Well, it looks like they're done waiting because it looks like they're starting to rise again uh, after that big sharp, sharp drop in, Q, um, in Q1. By the way, uh, polling, 82% of our audience is entrepreneurs. Uh, we have 4% investors, uh, a handful of service providers like me. 35% of you identify as technologists. Looks like we got a few students and a couple of other. So I'm going to end polling. I'll even share the results if anybody's interested. All righty. So let's start from the beginning. Before we talk about how to negotiate with VCs, I wanna go over a couple of, uh, I guess, housekeeping items. Uh, number one, let, let's talk about, are you a candidate for venture capital? 82% of you are startup entrepreneurs, so you've started a business. Uh, but the first question we have to ask is that, should you even be talking to VCs at all? Uh, if you tuned in uh, last week when we did this, I told a story about how I once wrote a blog post called Why Venture Capital Funding is Funding of Last Resort, uh, generated a lot of interest, probably the most wide read, widely read blog I ever, I ever uh, created, uh, and it got a lot of response. People actually stopped what they were doing, took the time to look up my email address and send me hate mail. Hate mail, that's how much they love that blog post. Uh, but I gotta tell you, it was very true. Venture capital is not for everybody. You gotta be a particular kind of company to even want venture capital. Uh, so are you that kind of company? Let's go through some of the factors. Number one, you got to be scalable, right? If you're the kind of company that you're going to get to be a $10 million business and then sell, you're not a candidate for venture. No way. You don't move the needle for a venture capitalist. An angel will put money into you, 
uh, your uncle will put money into you, but a VC just won't. There's just not enough money there. Um, even if you're going to be a $100 million company, you're not going to get the interest of the VCs. They want you to be a company that can scale into a huge market. Now, when I say a huge market, it doesn't even have to be a market that exists. Think about Airbnb, think about um, Uber and Lyft, which California is trying to chase out of the state right now. Um, think about these, and by the way, Airbnb was started in a recession. So uh, don't think that good companies can't start and get funded in times like this. But think about companies like that, their market didn't even exist when they were, when they were created. You can think about that a lot did not even exist, but they were huge markets. And the people that pitched those decks, they had the vision and they were able to telegraph that vision and let the investors know that this is a huge market, doesn't exist, but it's going to. And when it does, it's going to be huge. Are you able to do that? Thirdly, um, explosive growth. You gotta be in the kind of business that you need venture money because you're going to use it. You're gonna be able to grow really, really quickly. Right, it's gotta be the kind of company that grows really quickly. Can't be like my law firm. It took me 15 years to, to build before I joined Haynes and Boone. It's gotta be something that can grow like that. VCs, and we're gonna talk about this in a minute. Um, the, you know, different VCs have different tolerance or appetites for how fast you can grow. And when you do your diligence on the VC, you're gonna to want to know that. But explosive growth, because the VC fund just doesn't stick around that long, 10 years tops, and they gotta be out. So they need you to exit by that time. They need you to grow. And if, so think about that. On average, that means five years, right? Sort of makes sense. If 10 years is how long a VC fund lasts, you know, average is about five years. You're going to meet them. So you got about five years to exit. Think of it that way. By the way, and when I say can the business scale, you know, keep in mind, and by the way, if you've got questions, put them in the Q&A box. We'll get to them at the end. Um, Companies that can scale, everybody thinks that means tech, te that means technology. Um, yes, it probably does, but don't limit yourself to technology. I hear a lot of people say, well, gee, it's a service company. It can't scale. That's not true. That is not true. A service company can scale if it's the right service company. A lot of them have, uh, but I think it's a little harder. People tend to think technology, but not exclusively. Where were we? Do you have a top team? Here's why I want you to think, do you have a top team? And a top team, most people will tell you, includes a technical co-founder um, because on the one hand, it's just really too hard to go out and try to, I mean, people are going to disagree with me on this, but I think from most venture capitalist perspective, it's awfully hard to go out and hire people to do the technology side. You want technology people who got skin in the game. Now, they might come along later, but they're going to have to have stock and they're going to have to be founder-like, even if they're not founders. I have Now, having said that, I have worked with companies that were super good at marketing. They were in the market. They had the market sewed up, but they had lousy technology and they still got funded because then they used the money to build the technology. So that does happen. But I do want you to think that when you're early stage and you're going to talk to a VC, they're looking at you and they want to know that, that you're the team that they can bet on. Now, everybody says this. Everybody says, you know, I have no real competitors. Um, I have to tell you something, you do. You have competitors, whether you know it or not. It just depends how you define competitors. And even if you don't have competitors, you will have competitors, you know, right? Because ideas are pretty hard to protect. I mean, intellectual property, I can protect for you. I can't protect an idea. And someone's gonna get your idea eventually. It's gonna get out there into the ether. So when that venture capitalist is looking at you, they're not only thinking how good your tech is, how good your idea is, can you scale, is it a huge market, blah, blah, blah. They're saying, is this the team that's going to take it? Is this the team I want to bet on? Knowing that the ideas are cheap, you know, and a lot of people, other companies may have this idea. I want to bet on the team that is most likely to succeed with this idea. So that's why I say have a top team, because that's what the VC is really betting on. Not so much the idea, but betting that you have the best possible chance of making that idea work. So if you have to bring on co-founders to make that happen, if you have to go bring pedigree into your company, if you have to get a technical co-founder, I would do it, right? I would do it because team is just so important. And finally, do you have an unfair competitive advantage? Uh, and this is the part that you don't, you don't hear much about, but it is very true. What in, I mean, I hear, I hear it expressed like that all the time. I mean, what is it that you have 
um, that's going to give you all of this stuff. What's going to get you into a huge market? What's going to give you explosive growth? What's going to allow you to scale? What is that one thing that's really going to hook people? And um, I can't describe it better than that, but I've been in enough meetings where you're sitting there listening to people describe something and all of a sudden they hit on that one thing that gets everybody's ears to perk up. You know, it's that one thing that they have that other people don't have that's going to give them that advantage. Let me use the kind of the, the boring obvious example is the one I just gave you. I worked with a company that the, the technology was kind of lousy, but um, their marketing team was just really good. Boy, they, they could sell uh, ice to an Eskimo. And no offense to any Eskimos who are here tonight. Got to be so careful these days. Um, but they could. They were very good salesmen. And um, that was the thing. When they told people that they could go out and they were an agricultural technology company, when they showed people that they could go talk to a farmer and get them to believe them and uh, trust them and buy their product, that was their competitive advantage. That's why their particular sensor, you know, what has gone through three rounds of funding now when there's a million companies out there doing the same thing. It's gotta be something, so keep that in mind. So now we know that you're a candidate for venture. Let's turn this around. Should you take venture? Like I say, remember my blog post, venture capital is financing of last resort. So uh, here's why. So number one, um, if you've got cash flow, uh, why would you want venture capital? You can take debt. Debt is way cheaper, right? Debt is way cheaper. You only have to pay back the debt and a little bit of interest. You don't have to give up a huge, big, a big percentage of your company. So if you've got cash flow, um, you want to think about debt. You can do venture debt, you know, but you want to think about debt, something where you can, you know, you can get your investor out of your hair down the road. Um, you're a candidate. For venture if you just have to give up equity because you don't have cash flow but instead um, you've got that possibility of scaling uh, instead uh, you you might you and you're risky you know with debt again if you default on debt the debt holder is going to have your company right so debt you, you won't take debt unless your company is a lot less risky than a typical venture back company at least at the early stage so think about this uh, if your proposition is, you know, high risk but super high return, um, and you don't have near-term cash flow, uh, and you're going to have to give up equity to raise money because no bank's going to lend to you, um, then you may be a good candidate for venture capital. That sounds like a country western routine, doesn't it? You might be a redneck and a candidate for venture capital um, if uh, you live in a trailer house and have no near-term cash flow. Finally, uh, just keep in mind that these investments are super illiquid. Um, so, um, and you're going to have to find an investor that's willing to live with an illiquid investment. What do I mean by that? They can't go sell it on the public markets. They can't get out. They can't even sell it in a secondary. Uh, that's what VCs do. They just hang on to it, you know, until you go to an M&A or possibly an IPO. All right, moving along, um, kind of staying with this theme. No, we're, we're going to get to the negotiation in a minute, but I want to tee this up. Um, company VC fit. Um, so we talked about this large potential market. Um, we talked about, I think we talked a little bit, or I implied the first mover or first to market advantage. Um, keep in mind that um, the VC is going to be in, <laughs> the VC is looking for a long-term gain here, right? Not short-term profits. They're not looking for a short-term return. Um, <clears throat> They're looking for a long-term gain, long-term meaning on average five years. And they're looking for companies that don't have cash flow. Instead, uh, they've, got, um, they've got the ability uh, to actually scale and turn their investment into a huge win, right? And here's the biggest thing. You'll hear this term over and over again, traction. We want to see companies with traction, right? So what is traction, right? What is traction? What that usually means, people will say, it doesn't necessarily mean revenue. That's what people generally think. Don't have to show revenue, but you have to show the company customers are going to buy your product, right? Companies are going to buy your product, right? That's traction. That's what you really want to show uh, before you can even uh, talk to a VC. Now, I get a lot of people that ask me for venture capital introductions, and that's the first question I have to ask. Show me, do you have traction? Because that's where we want to go to first. All right, let's talk a little bit about um, the different rounds that you might do. Now we're going to start to get into some of the meat of this. 
Um, there was a time when companies went from um, early, um, early stage uh, to a series A and then kind of worked their way through the alphabet. Um, these days, I mean, we don't have really quick IPOs. We used to have fast IPOs 20 years ago, four years, you'd go public. 20 years ago, everybody thought they were going public next year. That was always what everyone said. You know, invest in me, we're going public next year. Um, it takes a long time for a company to go public, if at all, right, if at all. So um, the result of that is companies would start getting into the alphabet. I, and I kid you not, I've seen companies have like their Series K and their Series M and their Series N. And at that point, if you've done that many series of preferred stock, you know, your investor, your next investor is going to look at you and wonder what the heck is wrong with you? You know, why can't you exit? Why do you need so much money and why do you keep missing, you know, uh, your projection so badly? So to combat that, um, what companies start doing is they said, look, we're not going to do Series A, we're going to do Series C really seed money, even though you're getting equity and not convertible debt or anything like that. So it's series C. All right. Um, and then um, that wasn't even enough, right? Then we went on to, well, you know, this isn't really series seed even. It's a pre-seed round. So we see that a lot too. This is pre-seed. You know, it's equity, but it's pre-seed. And it might be a convertible. Uh, and then eventually, you know, you just have to do it. You have to get into the alphabet. You just have to do your Series A. And finally, you raise enough money, it looks legitimately like a Series A. Uh, and then you're going to take more money. Well, gee, we're not ready for Series B. So we start number A1, A2. I'm pausing on this because you should be sensitive to this. You should be sensitive because image is important. Presentation is important. And usually the difference with Series A1, Series A2, et cetera, um, as we do this is uh, basically the price is changing. Nothing else about the stock is changing the preferred, it's just that the price is changing. And plus, just subconsciously, we're trying not to get too far into the alphabet. So keep that in mind when you start to think about what you're going to offer when you go out uh, to the market. Let's talk about the types of funds that, that you might get involved in. Um, so, you know, let's define a few terms before we get into this. Then we're going to talk about angels. So there are, before you get to VCs, or even when you get to VCs, there are what we call micro VCs. There are smaller VCs. I'm seeing tons of them these days. There's lots of them these days. And in effect, what they are, are angels with, with OPM, other people's money. It's angel investors who have really gotten all their friends together uh, and are using their money uh, in, in order to invest. Um, Sort of like a super angel, only you've got, in, you've got uh, it's a pooled investment vehicle, you've got, it's an institution, and you've got pooled funds behind it. Uh, I'm going to tell you why it's important to know this in a minute. Then we have, we've seen the rise of seed stage funds. Uh, they're early, usually the first institutional money in, but they are an institution, they are a real fund, and a lot of the major VCs have established seed stage funds because they want to get into the deal early enough that they can get the later bigger deal. It's not that they really expect, you know, their $100,000, you know, in your company is, is going to uh, turn into anything that is uh, going to move the needle for them. It's more they just want to have that hook in you. So they create seed stage funds. Or it's a true seed stage fund um, that's not attached to a VC. Mid-stage, um, series B and beyond, and then late stage. I'm not sure many people here care about late stage funds, but they are out there. You know, the other thing I want to mention now is uh, people are getting really creative with funds. So keep that in mind. Almost anybody who, it's, it's a very lightly regulated industry. I know people will tell you it's a regulated industry. That's, that, that's sort of true. We're not going to get into the technicalities of the Investment Advisors, Advisors Act. Let's say it's lightly regulated. So almost anybody can call themselves a venture capitalist and get away with it. So what we are seeing are SPVs, special purpose vehicles special purpose funds, right, um, that are put together for one particular investment, a group of people, they pool their investment. Uh, we're seeing now the latest thing is rolling venture funds um, where they raise money. We used to call them opt-in, opt-out funds. Um, they're all variations on this. But what I want to talk about tonight are more of the true venture capital funds. And then when you talk to them, when you do your diligence, find out how close they are to this true model. Uh, because if they're not, then you have to wonder about other considerations, like are they going to have dry powder, or are they going to have follow-on funding, et cetera. So let's talk a little bit about angels before we get into this. Um, um, we should do a whole program on angels. Uh, but 
a, a couple things. Um, the good thing about having angels in your company, if you've got the right angels, is they are one of the best connections you're going to have to the venture community. They've got skin in the game. They believe in you. They put money in you. They've got connections. A lot of VCs, they rely on their deal flow from angels. So you get the right angel in your fund. That's going to help you get funded down the road. Ideally, they can be good advisors to the company, provide mentorship, right? They can, they can give you what, they, what you need because they've been through this 100 times. You've only done this once, right? Maybe twice. Um, and finally, they're willing to put up capital and not be big babies about it if they lose their money. They understand this is a risky venture. So that's the great thing about having angels. Uh, the bad part is if you think anyone can be a VC, almost anyone can be an angel. They just have to be accredited for the most part. Uh, that doesn't mean they know what they're doing. Doesn't mean that they're not going to be complainers. Doesn't mean that they're not going to be demanding, sometimes extremely demanding uh, of your time. They want reports. They want financials. They want this. They want board meetings all the time. Um, you want to check that out because it can be hugely distracting because think about it. You're going to have a, if you start taking angel money, you're going to have a lot of angels in your company. You're going to have a lot of them. So if you've got a bunch of ankle biters at you all the time saying, give me reports, call me up. What about this COVID thing? You know, how's that affecting you, et cetera. Uh, the worst is what I call hostage takers, where um, they've got some right uh, that they've negotiated. Maybe it's a pro rata that they won't give up, but they've got some right that's going to hold you up when you do go to the venture capitalist. So make sure your angels are reasonable, right? You got to make sure they're reasonable people to deal with whatever rights they've got. If they have to give them up, they give them up. If they have to come off the board, they will come off the board. Uh, you don't want people that are going to hold you for some concessions before they give that to you. There are a lot of people like that in the world. That's a negotiation tactic. It's a style. You know, I've got something. If you want it, if you want me to come off the board, if you want me to waive my right to a pro rata share of the next investment, uh, if you want me to give up my warrants, whatever it is, um, give up my anti-dilution, whatever it is, then you have to give me something for it. Um, yeah, that's not fun. It's not a great discussion. You want people that are interested in the success of the entity itself. And then finally, um, potential plaintiffs uh, is the only way to describe these people. Um, if they've never, you know, if they've never invested in companies before, um, you know, because it can get pretty ugly down the road when you get in, you know, when you start dealing with the VCs, everything gets reshook. That economic deck gets redealt every time around. And there are winners and there are losers. And you want people that understand that sometimes you're the windshield, sometimes you're the bug. That doesn't mean you go sue the car every time you're the bug. But there are people like that. So just, you know, fill them out. Here's a, and by the way, here's a piece of advice for you, not only for your angels, but for your VCs that you deal with that for anybody you hire, anybody you do business with, any law firm you work with, here's some advice, you know, go check the docket, right? Like I got a Pacers account. I don't do business with anybody who's litigious, just won't do it. Um, check out who you're dealing with. If you find that they sue their companies over and over again, you do not want to do business with them, okay? If you find out they get sued over and over again, that's probably a red flag, right? The best way to find out if you're getting in bed with a potential plaintiff is to go down to the courthouse, you know, or you can do it online now. COVID, I know, we got to stay home. Check it out online and, uh, you know, see if, um, uh, see if they're litigious. And finally, there are people that just cause trouble. They're just disturbers. They're always disturbing, right? And they're always complaining. They, they don't like the CEO. They don't like the management team. Uh, they're always complaining. You're going to know who they are fairly soon. I hope you don't get people like that in your company. They are toxic. Distraction is toxic. And the worst part is not so much that they're going to keep you awake at night, but when they go to your later investors, and I have seen this happen, folks. Um, I've seen angels, you know, talk the later investors out of investing. I've seen that happen. They say, look, you're, this company isn't worth this. You know, we'll talk a little bit later why that might happen, uh, but you don't want people who are going to do that, even if it's in their personal best interest to do that. You don't want them screwing up your later deal, and there are people that do that. So know your angels. By the way, you'll hear a lot of angels talk about how they got to know the company, they got to do diligence, you know, the company has to be this, the company has to be that. I'm turning it around. You want to know who your investor is as much as they want to know who you are. It's a two-way street. Okay, so now we're up to the VCs, right? And we're talking to VCs. We've got our angels, we've got our... Um, 
trying to move my chat box. We've got um, our um, seed stage money. We've got our friends and family. We're talking to VCs. So here's the way this typically works. Typically, you find a lead, right? You find one lead, maybe two, co-lead, but you find a lead investor. In other words, a lot of rounds, you're going to have more than one VC in it. You might have a half a dozen. It doesn't mean you negotiate with half a dozen different people. And what they call a party round these days, you might have a bunch of angels and a bunch of VCs. So they got 20 people in the deal. You don't negotiate 20 times over. You find a lead, you know, you negotiate that deal and everybody else follows. Now, um, the lead here, um, you want to be, um, so, so think about this for a minute, uh, timing wise. Uh, and this is why you have to do your diligence on the VC. So when you sit down and talk to the VC, make sure you understand their process, right? Remember that word process. In fact, write this down. What is your process, all right? And what you're asking them when you ask them that is how long is it going to take before they get to a decision? Who's going to make that decision? When might you expect to have it? Here's why you want to know that, because timing is important, because you're going to be talking to more than one VC at a time, right? Ideally, in a perfect world, you're going to, and this happens for well-advised companies that do this right, that orchestrate this, you're going to get a bunch of term sheets at about the same time, and we're just going to compare term sheets, right? You're the prettiest girl at the dance, and you're just going to figure out who you want to dance with. So um, how do you do that? Well, you kind of want to know how long it's going to be before the people you're talking to will give you that term sheet, and how long they're going to let you sit on it before you get back to them. That's what you want to have happen. You'd like to have competing term sheets that you can compare so you can pick one or play one off against the other. So that's number one. Understand the process. That's one reason. Second reason, you don't want a slow no. You want a fast no. You don't want to be dealing with a VC who's going to lead you on forever and ever. Just figure out, I mean, is this the kind of VC that has a process and they're going to give me an answer or am I just going to be sitting here turning down everybody else because I'm hoping and waiting for them? You know, cross them off your list. If, you know, they, you know, VCs tell companies fail fast. <laughs> you know, I tell you, it goes the other way around too. You want that deal to fail fast if it's not going to happen. Now, here's another little piece of advice. This is inside baseball. You sit down and you talk to the venture capitalist because you're such a hot company, you're doing well. And uh, you're looking for a lead. And they're going to say to you, I promise you, they're going to say, are you talking to anybody else? And they're going to say, well, of course we are. We're a hot company. Everybody in town wants to invest in us. And they're going to say, well, who else are you talking to? All right, you don't tell them. You're not going to tell them that. Uh, if you do tell them that, uh, I'm going to tell you something. The next call the VC makes is going to be whoever you say you're talking to. So use a little common sense here. This is a negotiation. They might be your best friend in the world. You're getting married to them in a business sense. You're going to be together for the next five to 10 years. But keep in mind, this is a business negotiation. They're jockeying for leverage just like you are. You can tell them that you're talking to the usual suspects. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Keep that in mind. All right, so now you're talking to the VCs. You're going up and down Sand Hill Road. I've been there myself many times. <laughs> I can tell you I had one meeting on Sand Hill Road. lasted all of 15 minutes. <laughs> I won't tell you which uh, top-tier VC it was, but, you know, he got about three slides into our, our pitch deck, and he said, you know, I got to go, man. You're not for us. Um, at the time, I was a little offended. I mean, I drove all the way up there from my office uh, on Page Mill Road. Um, but looking back on it, um, Guy did us a favor, you know, it was the right thing to do. Uh, so uh, anyway, um, that's a digression. Anyway, you, you, you do want to get to a quick yes or a quick, a quick no. You want to know who your lead is. Uh, and then, you know, there they're like, will, likely will be followers. And then the other type of round is going to be a party round, we call that, where you're just going to have lots and lots of investors. Talk about herding cats. Good luck with that. But a lot of deals are being done that way. Uh, but just keep in mind, you want to find a lead to negotiate with and then just you know, do the deal with them. You know, in later rounds, when you've got, you know, big, aggressive, assertive, uh, dominant VCs in your early rounds, there's no way to avoid the fact that you've got multi-party negotiations, right? At that point, you have to be an expert uh, at uh, shuttle diplomacy and game theory. I will just tell you that right now. Go, yeah, go buy a book on game theory, read about the prisoner's dilemma. You're gonna have to know this stuff when you get into later rounds and your Series A is negotiating to give up, give up rights to your Series B, uh, who's also keeping an eye on the Series C. But for your first round, just find that lead and uh, hang on. Other parties in the deal. 
hold on here. I'm going to read to you what they say about lawyers in the deal. This is from a book. This is one of my favorite books. And by the way, there are a lot of books on venture capital. I've read a ton of them. Uh, I really like uh, this one here, Venture Deals, uh, by uh, who is it? Brad Feld and Jason Mendelson, two former lawyers themselves, Venture Deals. So, but don't take it from me. Uh, here's what they say about choosing a lawyer. You don't want an inexperienced lawyer creating unnecessary tension in the negotiation. Don't let a VC talk you out of using your own lawyer just because they're not from a nationally known firm or if the lawyer rubs the VC the wrong way. This is your lawyer, not your VC's lawyer. That said, you need to be close enough to communication to make sure your lawyer is being reasonable and communicating clearly and in a friendly manner. So think about the delicate dance that your lawyer is doing for you. He is your face. He is representing you in this negotiation. If he's unreasonable, they're going to think that you are unreasonable. Okay, just keep that in mind. So it's got to be somebody who knows the market well enough that they're not going to ask for a lot of unreasonable things, but they have to represent your interests well enough that they're going to advocate for you. My rule of thumb, I'll just, you know, I'll just tell you that every negotiator should ask for one unreasonable thing just to know if you're dealing with somebody who knows what they're doing. And if you don't get it, you don't fight it. You don't bang your fist on the table. You don't make a big deal. You don't create any bad will. Uh, but that's it. You know, you don't want to. You don't want unreasonable, but you want to be protected. Now there are a couple places where um, you really do have to have a lawyer advocating for you. Now I remember uh, sitting in a conference like this, and uh, there was a top tier VC stood on stage, and he said, "You know, when a lawyer from law firm XYZ, public, well known." nationally known, excellent law firm, excellent law firm. He says, when I see the company has that law firm representing them, I don't even get a lawyer because I know that guy's going to protect my interest. Okay. You don't want somebody that friendly. <laughs> Let me just put it that way. You don't want somebody so friendly that your opposing party doesn't even hire a lawyer. So it is a delicate dance, uh, but you can, you can uh, thread that needle if you're careful. And uh, there are a couple places where this comes up. It does become important because there are, there is, the market is a range. Okay, let me give you an example. We're going to talk more about this later if I have time. Vesting restrictions, right? If your lawyer is inexperienced, they're going to demand a single trigger, at least you're in Silicon Valley. It's different in other places. I know, and you're from all over the world. Single trigger, you know, every VC is going to push back on that. What a single trigger means that you fully vest in your shares uh, if the company gets sold or if you get terminated without cause. Um, you can't push on that too hard. On the other hand, uh, an ex inexperienced lawyer might not know enough to ask for a double trigger. There's a range, and we negotiate between that range, uh, between having no trigger at all and having a single trigger. We oftentimes end up with a, a, a compromise that you, the VC, if you get terminated within six months of a, or you, the founder, if you get terminated within six months of a change of control, you're going to get some or all accelerated vesting, stuff like that. You want to know where the range is. You want to know where the middle of the range is. You want to be able to negotiate within it. You do not want to be outside the range. It's going to cause your legal fees to go way up. It's going to piss off the VC. It might tank your deal. The CPA, uh, you rarely see a CPA in a deal. You should see them more often. And I'll tell you why. Uh, number one, you need someone to vet the financials. Uh, you're going to have to get audited statements after you close the deal. So I hope your financials are good. You're going to have to stand behind your financials. And I've seen, you know, crazy things happen where people, you know, think they're an accountant and they go on quick and then they do everything wrong and we don't figure it out uh, until after. Um, and here's a third one. Write this down. This is a tip. No one else is going to tell you about this because there aren't many tax lawyers that actually do this stuff. It's called Section 382. Uh, when you do your financing, you might end up giving up all your net operating loss carryovers. Now, here in California, that doesn't mean much as a state matter. It means a lot as a federal matter. You at least want to know what you're giving up. Uh, what a net operating loss carryover is, it means you had a bunch of losses because you're a venture, you're a soon-to-be venture-backed startup. You had a bunch of losses. You're going to use those tax losses to offset income in the future. Um, you lose that benefit if you have what they call an ownership control. That's as technical as I'm going to get about it. I do about an hour on this in another presentation you can find on my YouTube site. But you want an accountant in there to, to advise you as to what it is you're giving up and how to navigate that. You might be able to avoid that, that bad, bad result. And you're going to feel really silly if you don't. Bankers, brokers, finders. 20 years ago, you found finders and broker dealers all over the place in this valley in all these deals. You don't so much anymore. 
You don't so much anymore because we've got the internet, first of all. Um, uh, and oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes it, you know, it looks a little bit desperate uh, to have um, uh, somebody that you have to pay to find money. But, but more importantly is that the uh, regulators have gotten a lot tougher on who can actually do this and what they're willing to get, get away with and who they're going to put in jail for being an unregistered finder. So you're not going to find brokers and finders uh, in the, at least not in early stage venture deals. Later on, of course you are, but early stage, not so much. Mentors and advisors, um, you know, you should early on, you know, surround yourself with mentors and advisors who are going to get you into that community. Uh, it's really good. Well, I better get speeded up here. We're running out of time. Okay, venture cap. I need to give, tell you about a venture capital economics. Know the enemy. If you're going to negotiate with somebody, you better know what they're thinking so you know what they need. First of all, think about what they need. The management is usually more often two and a half percent. In the later stage, it's two percent. But you know, they their fund, they get a two and a half percent management fee that covers their salary, their rent, etc. Usually, they get a twenty percent carried interest. That means that's a percent of the profit on on the investments they make. This is the VC, the fund that you're that's you're trying to get to invest in you, and they tend to last seven to ten years. All right, that means on average, you know, your your venture fund is about ten years. Their LPs, they want two and a half times uh, their investment return. That's what they promise them. So that means the VC, we could sit down and do the math, but trust me on this, it's going to have to make three or four times their investment on all of their investments uh, to pay that back. Okay, so. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, that's what they're looking for. Now, let's just drill down. Let me tell you what that means to you a, a little bit better. Expect it, right? Venture capital, I think they have to expect, because their investments are so risky, they just have to expect that about half of them are going to lose money. And that's the, the good, bigger funds. I've invested a lot of VC funds that lost money on every single investment they made. Yes, it's true. I'm an idiot. Uh, that's why I'm a lawyer and not a client. Uh, so you just have to expect that a lot of these, you know, funds are, are, you know, are going to expect to have a lot of losses. On the other hand, some percentage, they're going to get their money back or maybe two times their money back. And then the rest have to be home runs. Now, let's do a little thought experiment because I want you to get inside that VC's head and understand what he's thinking. After everything I've told you, you're the VC, they made one investment. Their investment turns out to be Airbnb or Netflix or, or Facebook or something. And they make 100 times their money on that investment. They make 500 times, whatever. They make 100 times their money. Okay, get your pen out. You get your slide rule, calculator. Let's do the math. If that's true, how much do they have to make on all their other investments now? So carry the one. You know what? The answer is it doesn't matter. doesn't matter. They need that one. They need that one. And they're looking for you to be that one. So be that one. All right, that's what you want to convince them is you're the opportunity that's going to make their fund for them. Uh, there was something else I wanted to say about this. Two and a half times their investment, three or four times. Okay, I'll come back to it. Venture capital management, know who you're dealing with when you're dealing with a VC. Partners make decisions, all right? If you're dealing with a partner, you can get a quick decision usually. They'll tell you they have to go back to some committee or something, but you've got a champion and a partner. Principals or directors are right below them. They're going to go back and get committee authority. They're not partners. Associates are below them. They probably don't have authority to make decisions. Analysts work for them. They're gathering data. And then there are these things called entrepreneurs and residents. Every VC is different, but these are some common categories. Look at that card when they give it to you. Understand who you're dealing with. Understand who you have to impress and, and figure out. Again, understand their process. Who's your decision maker? I know what I was going to tell you earlier. When you do your diligence, remember what I said, a fund is seven to 10 years, okay? When you take that venture money, unless you're extremely lucky, it's not gonna be the only round you get. Uh, and it shouldn't be, you should stage your financings. Right? We're gonna talk about that in a minute. So when you talk to the VC, it'd be awfully nice if they could participate in your B round if you let them into the A round. It'd be nice if they were there to do the next round for you. It'd be nice because you don't have to go through the, the courting process all over again. It also would be nice because you don't have to go tell some investor that, yeah, my VC, you know, he thinks I'm a loser. They won't invest in my second round. You know, that's what it looks like. Well, how do you know if they're going to be around to do that? Where are they in their life, right? If it's the first year of the fund, that's way better for you than if they're in the ninth year of the fund. 
because they're not going to be around. Now, they might do a follow-on fund. You know, they might do another fund. They might have parallel funds and other ways to accommodate that. But check that out. Check that out. You want to know you got someone that's going to be with you for the long term when you do your later rounds. Okay, that's the point I wanted to make about that seven to 10 year term. Okay, here's what you can expect. We're getting down into some more of the, the gritty stuff here. Um, two, two things, economics and, and, and control. Um, that, that's what Feld and Mendelssohn say. Think about it in terms of economics and control. You know, the rest is all just noise. Uh, that, that's my editorializing. So the venture capital, it is the nature of venture capital that they participate in management. That is what distinguishes uh, a venture fund and a venture capital strategy from everything else. Right, so they're going to take a board seat. Uh, they just will, you know. Don't fight them on that one. Uh, if you know, they're probably going to want observers uh, in, in later rounds for sure when you don't have enough board seats to go around. And if they can't have that, they're going to have what they call a management rights letter, which allows them to participate in management theoretically. Um, what does this mean to you? It sort of precludes small investments. You're not going to a venture capital fund for a small investment. Number one, it doesn't move the needle. You know, for a $500 million fund to invest a million dollars in you, you know, unless, you know, it's, it's just not going to, it's not likely to, right? So uh, they're going to have to make bigger investments because they have to justify the fact that that partner that I told you about has got to go to your board meetings. Now, it's easier with Zoom, of course, than it used to be, but it's still a distraction. They got to read the board package. You know, they got to get involved. They got to, you know, listen to management complain, or you got to listen to them complain, whatever it is. You know, they got to get involved. It's a time commitment. So there's only so many investments that each one of these guys can make. It's got to be a relatively large investment. Do your diligence. Talk to their prior investments. How big are their bets? How big are their investments? That's where, that's where you want to be. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, so that's not quite it, uh, venture capital economics. And then metrics. Um, we talked about the fact that they're looking at for the team. Uh, technology is good. They want you to solve problems. Must be a huge market. We talked about this. I want to, I'm, I'm not done with picking a VC. Look at their reputation. You know, some VCs, and, and we know who they are. We know what they're like. We've been in this valley a long time. They get a reputation and they get it pretty fast and, and word spreads. Uh, how likely are they to close if you get a term sheet? Okay. You're in Silicon Valley. You get a term sheet. It's pretty, you're pretty likely to close. Um, I did a deal uh, last year, it was a term sheet from a big VC in another country, I won't say which one. We not only did we get the term sheet, we negotiated every last comma in this contentious negotiation, by not contentious, but it took a long time. Um, and right down to the end, the day they were supposed to fund, uh, they sent us a little email, said we changed our mind, we're not funding. Okay, you would do that once in Silicon Valley and you'd be done. You'd never make another investment. I'm just telling you, because word would get around if a smart founder like you does, does, their, does their homework and they look around and you find out what people say about them and their ability to close. We talked about the stage of the fund. We talked about the size of the fund and the size of the investment they're making and how that fits with what you're doing. How much dry powder do they have? It'll be in their reports. Do they have money for a follow-on round? Is there a fund two? Is there a fund three? Is there going to be? Uh, we talked about all this stuff, process, timing, art of litigious, difficult. Structuring, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because we're running out of time and we do a whole program on structuring for venture capital. However, I will say that you do have to put some thought into this. You want to be a Delaware C corporation if you're taking venture. You don't have to be one today. You have to be one at the time you close that venture round. So let's make sure that you're able to do that. You're not going to get hung up by a hostage holding angel uh, or by a big tax problem that happens. I can help you with that. Um, or by something wrong with your cap table. Talk about that in a minute. Um, or by investing, you can't get someone to agree to vesting. You need to have a company that's a Delaware C Corp. Founders are, are unvested or willing to invest. You have a cap table that's got enough equity left over so you can bring in a management team and you don't want debt if you can avoid it on your cap table. I want to pause on one aspect of this now uh, so I can get to it before we run out of time because it's so important. It's gotten so easy now for you, the founder, the entrepreneur, to go online, to go on a website, download a safe, download a convertible note, download whatever it is, sell that security, probably in an unlawful offering, um, and uh, end up with uh, people having some sort of convertible interest in your company and you have their cash, so you're happy, you got their money. 
but you don't really know what they have because what you sold them is a convertible and it converts at some later date into some unspecified number of shares or percentage. Okay, we do a whole program on this. So check our YouTube channel. That's not a problem till it's a problem. It's not a problem until you get a sophisticated VC and pull your cap table up, get the Excel spreadsheet up and start doing what ifs. Okay, if you're not good with Excel, you better be, right? But by the way, you know, I'm taking a Coursera on Excel. It's so important, even though we've all got card debt, you still need to know Excel because you gotta do what ifs. You gotta do what if we convert all of these convertibles, all these safes in the stock at this value, that value, all this convertible debt. What if those warrants we gave to our landlord, you know, are exercised? You gotta know that because I've had deals many times, more and more now, because it's getting so easy. The accelerators are incubators. And even some law firms are saying, don't bother me, kid. Go out and, you know, download that form online and do your own safe. Come back when you got a big deal. Well, you're going to have a big deal if you do too much of that, because you're going to give away too much equity. You need to watch that. You need to watch that carefully. I've had deals crater more than once because the founder gave away too much equity on a convertible and nobody even knew it was a problem until the VC told them and said, look at your cap table after you convert. There's not enough here for the founders. We can fix that, you know, if you have to, but it's not pretty. All right. Qualify small business stock. That's a tax benefit uh, investors want. Um, this is why you don't want to be an LLC or why we want to convert to a C Corp. Uh, we do whole programs on that. I'm going to go past that. How much money should you ask for? You're approaching the VC. Okay, here's another practice pointer. Here's a tip. Here's two things you don't do. Number one, don't put a number in, in your uh, executive summary or your pitch deck. Other people are going to tell you something different. I know. Well, Royce's rule is you don't talk numbers, okay? It's just salesmanship 101. Um, you sure as heck don't talk valuation, right? Until they ask you. Okay, number one, when they ask you, you don't tell them a range, right? You don't say between 10 and 20 million, whatever I can get. You know, you tell them we need $10 million because this is what we're going to do with it. We're going to spend it. And it's not we're going to spend it on market, getting into the market and developing the IP. They already know that. You're going to say we're going to spend it to get us to this valuation point. You give us $10 million now and we're going to give you a $50 million company 12 to 18 months from now. Right, we're going to double your money in 12 to 18 months. And here's why, because it'll take this much money to build out the tech, get into the market, take this space, blah, 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 whatever it is, you know, map that out. Be super clear about that. You know, um, pro formers are just pro formers. You know, we all know there's an element of crystal ball gazing and magic involved, but you got to have a plan, right? You got to have a plan. So George Foreman said, plan your fight and fight your plan. Well, I want you to plan your fight. Tell them what you're going to do with that money. And it should take 12 to 18 months, and you should be able to show how you're going to increase the value, get to the next milestone, and hopefully that milestone will double the value of your company. We talked about research, talked about multiple term sheets. I think we even talked about introductions. Uh, but no, we didn't talk about introductions. How do you meet a VC? Uh, we talked about approaching a VC, what you're going to be telling them about $10 million is going to double your money in 12 months. How do you find those guys? The best is from another VC. If you've got friends who are VCs, you show it to them, they say, gee, we're not really in the flying cars right now, but I know someone who is. Um, that's great. They'll make that introduction. Angels, great. If you got an angel that said, yeah, I, I know the guy for you for the next round. Um, funded startup entrepreneurs, find out who the venture capitalist has funded. You can find it on PitchBook. You can find it on Crunchbase. It's out there. It's amazing how much data is out there. Um, find out who they fund it. And talk to those guys, and if they will recommend you to the venture capitalist, that's gold. And then finally, there's industry and service people like myself. But you do want a warm introduction, um, and um, uh, you want a relevant introduction. Please don't ask somebody to make to just shotgun an introduction to somebody that you don't think is going to be a good fit. Uh, first of all, and don't ask me to do that. You embarrass me. You embarrass yourself. I'm not going to do it. You know, I did that. You know, every lawyer does that once in their life. And, you know, and then the VC calls you back and says, don't do that to me again. You know, you, you know what I invest in. Just send me something that's relevant. I know what's relevant for these guys, but I won't send something that isn't. But find a people that make a good warm introduction. Um, I suppose you can cold call. These people aren't hiding, but I don't know. Good luck with that. Do an executive summary. 
if you uh, text me or email me, don't text me, email me or contact me, I'll give you a template for an executive summary. One or two pages, that's it. And by the way, my executive summary is different than others that you've seen. It's different than even what a lot of VCs will tell you to do. So it's kind of like, don't take the VC's word for what they think they want. Take my word for what they want, right? What they really want is not your grandiose high-level explanation of how you're going to save the world. I know you are. What they really want is they want a quick, you know, read on whether you're raising the right money in the right sector and you get the right people, you get the right intellectual property. You know, they want a quick read so they know whether to turn the next page or flip the next card. That's what my executive summary template will do for you. Pitch deck, you know, we could do hours on that. Financial models, you got to have them. Don't think you can get away with it just because it might be all smoke. And due diligence, okay? Do your diligence beforehand. That means your company's got to be nice and you got to run a tight ship before you even get to the venture capitalist. You don't want them looking at your company and seeing that everything's been incorporated online and no one ever got around to fixing all those problems, right? If that's the way you handle your, you know, your documentation, then how do you handle the rest of your company? Same with technical, right? You know, you want, you know, you want your, you want your technical stuff to be in order. You want to be able to present your technology uh, in a way that shows a lot of thought has gone into it. Uh, same with team. Do your diligence. By the way, they're going to do their diligence on you. They're going to do a background check on you. Let's say that again. They are going to do a background check on you. So you know, if you've got something in your background that you might not want them to know, like a felony conviction. Um, you better be upfront about it. They're going to find that out. Uh, and if someone on your team has that in their background, you better know it. You better know about it. Uh, just word of the wise, uh, stuff like that. Uh, I'm not saying you need to do criminal background checks on your VCs. I am saying you want to know who they are and you want to know what they're going to know about you. All righty. Whoops, what happened here? Uh, I'm not going to get into this. We already talked about this a little bit. These are convertibles. Be careful about this stuff. Uh, yes, they will check your credit history. Use your questions for the Q&A box, but yeah, I should mention that. Um, cap table, we talked about. Get really good with Excel. Seriously, I'm on a course on Coursera and Excel. I'd recommend it. It's, you know, it, 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 it's kind of like whoever thought I'd have to learn typing again after high school, but now everybody types. There's no such thing as a secretary. Whoever thought you'd have to know Excel after Carta and Certant and Capture well, you know what you do because everybody uses spreadsheets, I guess you use other types of spreadsheets, but you got to know this stuff. You got to be able to do math, right? You're going to ha have to be able to put together, uh, you know, stuff like this um, and do your what ifs. And you should do what ifs ad nauseum, uh, understanding where you're going to end up uh, pre and post financing. Uh, we're not going to get into this technical stuff. I do want to talk about stage financings. You want to raise enough to get to the next valuation event. You'd like that to be within a year or two. You'd like it to be two times your money. And here's the other thing I want to just pause. I'll probably have to end on this. Unfortunately, yeah, we didn't even get halfway through. We're going to have to do a part two, Rob. Sorry to say. Um, up versus down rounds. Now, this is so counterintuitive, right? But this is where you got to be smarter than the VC. All right, you're negotiating. Um, and you know your company better than anybody. The VC is going to tell you they know it better than you, but you know it better than they do. You know, I'm just going to tell you that right now. I mean, I've had enough board meetings after that first investment to know. So you're going to know when your stock's a little overpriced. You're going to have that gut feeling before they do. And I got to tell you, you do not want to do too big a round if it means you have to do a down round. So it's counterintuitive. You're thinking, I want to get the biggest valuation I can. No, you don't. You don't want to get the, and you're thinking, because what's the harm if I overshoot and the valuation is too high, it'll adjust in the next round that I do. Yes, but you send one heck of a bad signal to the market, one heck of a bad signal to the market, plus you trigger anti-dilution adjustments, uh, plus you force your management team out of, the, out of the money, you've granted them options that are overpriced, there's a whole cascade of effects. So get the valuation right, even if you have to put a little bit more effort into it, uh, into analyzing this and studying this and taking a really good, hard, honest look at yourself and your company as to where you expect to actually be uh, with that money. Uh, and again, it helps to have a crystal ball and know what's going to happen with this COVID stuff. But just keep in mind, you know, down round is not the end of the world. You'll come back from it. You'll survive. 
but you sure as heck don't want to plan into it, all right? Don't plan into a down round. Okay, next session, you know, we're going to get into some of the nuts and bolts. We'll talk about pitch decks. We'll talk about executive summaries, and we're going to talk about term sheets. I don't have time to do it now. We have a whole presentation on term sheets. We get into the specifics. Uh, there's just too much to say here. We couldn't do it in one hour, so I'm going to go ahead and conclude this portion of the program and open it up to questions. So, if you'll bear with me. Let me go to my Q&A box. Holy cow, we got a lot of questions. All right. Um, okay, I'm going to stop sharing. There we go. All right, questions. First question. Okay, this is the first one that came in. Took seven minutes for your first question to come in. Come on, people, what's wrong with you? I have an event, an invention. I funded the proof of concept. I'm working on a marketing one pager, but uh, when I carry out market due diligence, customers want a working prototype, which is expensive. What should I do? Um, and how do? And I have a provisional. You know, is that worth anything? Uh, how come patents are so expensive? Why are you lawyers cost so much? I added that last part. Okay. Um, yeah, you, you, this is why you don't go right to a VC. Every once in a while I get that question, usually from out of town, it's like, hey, I got an idea. Can you introduce me to a VC? Well, yeah, if your name's Zuckerman, I can, but otherwise, no, I need to see something more than that. Um, so you're gonna have to go do a friends and family round. You're gonna have to do an angel round. You're gonna have to use some of your own money, possibly. We did a whole presentation on this last week. You know, go ahead and use some of your own money if you have to. But not a lot. Don't break yourself. Don't 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 use your 401k. Don't mortgage your house. Uh, use your friends and family. Use whatever it takes to get that prototype. You know, even though it's expensive, it should be that expensive. But you got you got first of all, you go from first you have to have proof of concept. Okay, that's number one. And before you go to the VC, you know, with rare exceptions, um, you need to have traction. Okay, and you're going to have to do that on your nickel and on the angel's nickel. Sorry, but that's life. Okay, the patent question. Um, yeah, provisionals are great. You need to patent early, you need to patent often. Um, we can help you with that. But the reason I say that is because the patent, a provisional patent, uh, you only got a year to replace it, but gives you a one year uh, priority date. That means that when you do get your utility patent, it dates back to the date of filing the provisional. Um, so it buys you a year, right? It starts that clock ticking and it's not very expensive. Um, you know, what I find with entrepreneurs, we do a whole program on legal mistakes. One big legal mistake is people are too shy about going out and getting patents. Patents are valuable. Patents, you know, allow you to keep other people out of your market. VCs love patents. You know, go get it before somebody else gets it first and knocks, knocks you out of business. Question number two, will the recording be shared? You're not paying attention. I said this at the beginning. Um, actually, some, some people probably joined late. Yes, we are sharing the recording. Uh, it's going to be on the Idea to IPO YouTube page. You'll also find it on my YouTube page at uh, Royce Law. Um, so what is the VC's view on funding a competing product to one existing in the market? Oh, thank you for the question. I'm going to expand on your question a little bit. Um, so, so first of all, you know, that if, of course, they're, they're going to fund a competing product because like I say, my view is that there are very, very few things in the world that don't have competitors, okay? Even though you think you don't have competitors, you probably do. You're just not defining competition correctly. Um, so VCs, by definition, are going to have to fund something that competes to another product existing in the market. The real question is, what if the VC has backed a company that is in a competing business or has a competing product? Now, um, God, I don't think I said anything bad about VCs this whole hour here. That's pretty good. Some of my best friends are VCs. That's probably why. But I have to warn you, there, there, are, there are good VCs and there are people out there who, you know, who are a little more ethically challenged. All right. Let me just put it that way. Um, here in Silicon Valley, you don't last long. It's a small community if you are like that. But in other parts of the world and other parts of the country, um, you know, it's not quite that way. I started my law practice in New York City, so I can tell you it is not quite like that in other places. So here's something you need to watch out for. Um, you need to watch out for the window shopper, okay? Watch out for the window shopper, and that is the VC that has no intention of investing in your company. It's that they 
you know, they funded a competing company and they just want to know what you're doing, right? They want to know how far along you are. They want to know what you're doing differently. You know, they want to see how you're going about it, what you think about it. And maybe they even take that intelligence back to their fund, back to their portfolio company. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, oh, I got a solution for that. My uncle, who's a lawyer, he gave me this form of NDA, and I'm going to wave this in front of the VC and say, here, find this NDA. Two things about that. Number one, no, you're not. Um, they will laugh you out of their office if you do that. And number two, even if they do sign it, you know, trust me, NDAs are hard to enforce. You know, as a practical matter, they are hard to enforce. Litigation is expensive, and you don't want to start litigation against, you know, someone who's got $500 million of money sitting in, in you know, uncalled capital commitments. You just don't want to do it. Thirdly, if you do get into a beef, especially that kind of beef with a VC, uh, you might not work in this valley again. It's like Hollywood, you'll never work in this town again. You might not work, in, you might not raise money in this valley again. You don't want to create problems, right? You want to avoid problems, you know? So again, when that happens, when uh, you know what, the, what, what they've invested in, it's all over their webpage, they're bragging about it, or if they're not, if they're stealthy, you know, you probably through word of mouth know what they've invested in. You probably know any industry, who the players are, you know, do not do that. Do not you know, talk to a VC, especially when he's sitting on the board of a competing company or asking for trouble. Okay, what else do we got here? When raising pre-seed or Series A1, A2, et cetera, is the cap table exactly the same? Are there any variances for these early A rounds? Yeah, there's lots of variants. Um, how much time do we have? You know, we do a whole program on this one, I think, too. So uh, pre-seed, um, it could mean it could mean a convertible, it could mean a safe. You know what a safe is? A simple agreement for future equity. They're not getting a stake in your company. They're getting a promise that you're going to give them stock in your company down the road at some point, at some future valuation or some discount to future valuation, subject to a cap. Um, there's a thing called Series Seed that came along. Um, a friend of mine at, a, at at Brand X Law Firm came up with this about 10 years ago. Um, he um, the idea was that you know, look, why are we doing, okay, here, in the old days, we used to have convertible, and by old days, it wasn't even that long ago, used to have convertible notes, you know, these phony baloney debt instruments that would never be repaid. They would just convert into stock. You just don't know what the value is today because you're too early. You don't know. The investor doesn't know. So it's like, how about if I give it the wimpy note? I, I, you know what? I should create my own note. I'm going to call it the wimpy and Popeye note. Um, I will gladly give you a hamburger on Tuesday if you give me a 25 cents today. That's what they were. You give me the money today, and I'm going to give you stock tomorrow when I get an institution to come in and value my company. It's the wimpy note. Um, and somebody came along and said, look, why don't we just do stock? You got a valuation cap anyway, so we kind of know what the value is. We'll just make it a really simple stock so that you don't spend a lot of time negotiating everything. Negotiating everything. We'll use standardized forms, right? And then you just go download them. You don't have to pay a guy like me for anything. But of course, it didn't work out that way. The founder downloaded it. The investor asked for this. The founder asked for that. The next thing you know, you had a negotiation going on near $20,000 in debt, you know, in legal fees. Um, that was the Series C documents. Um, you know, there was the theory and the practice. Um, but one of the differences about it is that they were standardized. They were simple. They were 1x non-participating. Um, we're going to talk about this the next time I do it, what participation and preferences mean. Uh, but they were very simple simple economic rights, very simple management rights. Okay, that's a Series C. Series A, more sophisticated, right? More robust management rights. The preferences might still be the same, kind of watered down, you know, we're just justifying the difference between preferred and common stock price preference, but um, more sophisticated, investor rights. You know, there are transfer restrictions. There might be, um, um, registration rights. There might be stuff like that. Okay, that's when you start getting into the alphabet. That's the difference between the Series C and the Series A, B, C, etc. What's the difference between Series A and A1 and A2? Usually just the price. Just the price. Same stock, same rights, same everything, you know. It's just that we sold it for a little higher price and we don't want to, you know, but we're only selling another $100,000 worth you know, we don't want to have to create another letter of the alphabet. Remember what I said, you get too many letters of the alphabet in your company, people are going to wonder what's wrong with you. You know, are you just always fundraising? Why don't you sell this company? 
So that's, that's, that's pretty much the variance. What about accelerators offering funds asking for zero equity? Well, that's a new one on me. The accelerators I deal with, they, uh, they ask for equity just to be an accelerator. Um, depends on the accelerator. I mean, for an early stage company, you know, at, at first I thought they were all, uh, they were all nuts for asking for so much equity, but um, I think they offer a lot of value. They get you into the community, they get you in front of people, they give you what you need, you get good advice from them. I'm not aware of accelerators offering, that makes no sense, funds for zero equity, nobody does that. They call that free money. Uh, if you know somebody giving away free money, uh, let me know. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm out of the business of giving these presentations if that's the case. Uh, what you will find with accelerators, however, um, here's the typical model, uh, and there's several different kinds, but you'll get an accelerator. Here's the model, and I've set this up many times myself. I like it, it works, I think it's a good model. Uh, it's, it's very complex, but I'll boil it down. The accelerator, uh, first of all, they put money into your company, a small amount, say $50,000. You turn around, you take a fund, the accelerator fund puts 50 grand, say it puts 100 grand into your company. You turn around, you give, and they take 6% of your company, sometimes eight, maybe a little less. You turn around, you give 50,000 of that back to the affiliated accelerator service entity. That entity gives you a program of instruction. They tell you what to do and they find you co-founders and they tell you how to do it and who to talk to and you know how not to do this and how to negotiate with VCs. And uh, sometimes the advice is good. Sometimes it is spectacularly bad, spectacularly bad. I can tell you stories. Nevertheless, you get that advice depends on the accelerator. Again, they all have reputations. Um, and uh, then a, a certain number of these companies are gonna take that 100,000, they're gonna get a little bit of traction, they're gonna do pretty well. They're gonna do so well that the accelerator fund or its affiliated fund is gonna make a bigger investment than them. And not only that, they're gonna bring all their buddies along and eventually you're gonna have VCs investing in that company. That's a great model. That's a great model. It gets you into an ecosystem that can do well for you. So check them out. There are good accelerators and, uh, and they're all different. That's one model. Then there's the other kind that they don't pretend to be there to get you money. They, they are there to get you into the ecosystem, introduce you to the people that do have money, uh, to give you the training and the knowledge and all the stuff that you need. The accelerator industry has come so far from where we started. I never used to like those. Uh, I think they're a good process. Uh, how do you find a good lawyer, lawyer for this process? You email me, I know one. Okay, if a VC makes uh, say 10 times returns on a fund, do the LPs also get additional returns? Okay, so the way, it, um, I don't wanna get too deep into this, but because it depends on the fund a lot of times, but, but generally the, the way it works uh, is that the LPs invest in the fund, uh, the fund invests in you, uh, they make 10 times their money on you, and they can either do this on an investment, on invest, investment by investment basis, or, or not, just on a, you have to return all the LP's money first. But the idea is the LP gets their money back and then uh, the VC uh, or the managers of the VC rather, they're going to get the carry, which is their profit, you know, usually 20%. <clears throat> and this excludes that two and a half percent management fee. Um, and then what's left over, whatever gain is left over, they'll get 100% until they get 20%. What's left over gets split 20, 80. That's generally it. So, um, I don't know if that answered your question, but the idea is, is that the LPs get their money back and you split what's left over 2080. And there's a million different ways to skin that cat. Sometimes there's a hurdle rate, depends on the fund. Uh, some smaller funds, there's usually not. Uh, bigger funds, there usually is, et cetera. I do a lot of fund formation stuff and uh, it, it really, it depends on the fund. By the way, you're gonna hear people tell you this is market, that's market, especially in fund formation. I think that's true at the bigger funds. Uh, don't fall for it if they tell it to you when you're negotiating with them. Okay, what is the YouTube channel for your previous videos? Um, Rob will find it and post it in chat. I don't know off the top of my head, but if you Google Roger Royce on YouTube or Royce Law on YouTube, you'll find all of my videos. I think if you search for Idea to IPO on YouTube, I know I've done it, you'll find Idea to IPO videos. Does C Corp have liability insurance protection like an LLC? I think what you're, wow, that's a cool name for a company. I'm really curious as to what you're doing there. Um, anyway, does C Corp have uh, liability insurance protection? Okay, I think that's two questions. Number one, 
Um, yes, LLCs give you protection from liabilities. So you, the owner of the LLC, do not have personal liability for debts of the entity. Same with the corporation, same with an LLC. They're about the same. I think it's a little bit more for an LLC, a little bit more for an LLC uh, because an LLC doesn't have to follow corporate formalities. Uh, corporations, typically it's one of the ways they pierce the corporate veil. Let me say something about that. We did a whole hour on this a couple of months ago because we're in a recession theoretically and you know things are bad, companies are suffering. I've been doing this for 30 some years. I've formed thousands of companies. Most of them are technology startups. Statistically, that means in most technology startups fail. They just do. That means most of the companies I've formed have failed. They've had creditors who've gone unpaid. A lot of those, they've been pretty unhappy. A lot of those have come back and sued the company. Never once, never once, has somebody pierced the corporate veil and held the founder liable. That's pretty darn good data, right? That's a pretty good data point for telling you that it's pretty good protection to have an LLC or a corporation between you and the business. However, it's not perfect um, because other people have not been so lucky. And um, that's why you want to have insurance. Uh, DNO insurance, you want director and officer insurance. If you're sitting on the board, you'll have to have it. If you get a VC investor, they will insist on it. Uh, you want it. Um, so uh, protect yourself in case something goes wrong. All right. Warm introduction. Um, you know, you just got to get somebody to believe in you, basically. Somebody asks, how do I get a warm introduction to a VC? Um, well, you have to, you know, you have to have an advisor, typically, or an angel, or somebody you're working with that understands your company and, um, and, uh, can, uh, and believes in you. What is it called when you look somebody up at the courthouse? Uh, you know, you can hire private investigators to do this. It's dirt cheap to go online and do investig investigative agencies. If you email me, I can hook you up with somebody that does this online. Um, but it, it really is. It's the information age. It's super easy. Uh, if you have a LexisNexis account, you can find out. If you have a Pacers account, you can find every court in the country. But anybody for free can go into any state court uh, uh, file and uh, just Google a name search for someone. Uh, with VCs, you don't have to do that. If you Google it, it's, if a VC is involved in litigation, Odds are pretty good. The press will pick it up. It'll show up in Google. For traction, how do you prove you have traction? Oh, it's so nebulous. Well, it'd be nice if you have a revenue. That'd be awesome. Um, if you don't have a revenue, it's great if you have subscriptions, users, accounts. If you show a lot of users but not, not a lot of revenue, people all know that game. You know, all you've done is you've given it away. Um, that's not necessarily bad. It's just, you know, it's just uh, not as good as being, see, the VC wants to know that people are going to pay for your product. That's what they need to know. And if you're just in beta, like I said, I do a lot of agriculture technology companies. A lot of them will give it away to the farmer to get it into the field. That's a little different because there the issue is not so much getting someone to pay for it. The issue is more just showing that they trust you and they will use your technology. I think it differs company to company. That's why domain expertise is so important. Get an advisor who knows your industry. They will tell you what traction is. They'll tell you when you got a winner or not. How do you find the right angels? Oh boy, that's a tough one. Um, unlike VCs, angels are not out advertising, right? They don't have big flashy websites. Um, um, some of them are, I mean, you can go on some of the, the websites. Uh, some of them even write books, <laughs> but um, I think just word of mouth. I think just understanding, for, like I said, I do a lot of ag and food tech. Uh, you know, we kind of all know who the people are around here that invest in that and who are interested. We do a lot of health tech as well, kind of know who's interested in that. FinTech, I don't know, it seems like FinTech investors, they, um, they have hyper literacy disease. They all want to write. So it's easy to find them. Just go look for blog posts. All right. We're a Delaware C Corp. We have trademarks. Um, PPA is being created. I don't know what that is. Do you mean PPM? For sharing the info of co-founders, uh, is equity crowdfunding possibly better for early revenue? Yeah, we did a whole thing on this last week. I've done a whole hour on crowdfunding. Um, I'm not going to do that tonight. Uh, I'm just going to leave you with this about crowdfunding. Uh, crowdfunding under the Jobs Act 2012, Congress created this new way that small companies could go out and sell their securities to uh, up to a million dollars, a little more than a million dollars, to a large number of people who are not accredited. You know what accredited means? It means rich, basically. 
sell it to almost anybody as long as they pass a fairly minimal net worth and net income requirement. That's crowdfunding. A lot of companies go out and they do crowdfunding. We talked a lot about it last week. Uh, I'm not going to talk about whether you should do it or not right now, given we got 10 minutes left. I'm going to talk about what the VCs think about it. Early on, I said, no crowdfunded company is ever going to get venture funded. I mean, what venture capitalist wants to invest in a company with a bunch of potential plaintiffs. You got a bunch of unsophisticated widows and orphans in your company. They're going to sue you if things don't go exactly right. And even if they do, didn't work out that way. Turned out that the VC community is willing to fund a crowdfunded company. Believe it or not, surprise me, but I've done it many times now. So uh, crowdfunding is not the bad thing that it used to be. However, you wanna get advice before you do this because there are some securities law tricks that are counterintuitive and you would only know this uh, if you went through the whole crowdfunding campaign from start to finish and all of a sudden every lawyer makes this mistake once in their life. There's like, wait a minute, I didn't see that coming. So there are a couple little tricks on the securities compliance side you wanna be careful about if you're going from crowdfunding to venture. See, a lot of these crowdfunding companies, they're not thinking venture. They're not thinking they're gonna do a venture round. They're thinking they're gonna do a crowdfunding round then sell for $10 million. That's not a venture capital. Okay, hold on here, what else we got? I'm gonna come back to your other questions because I gotta get through some of these other ones. Uh, my email address has been posted, how to find info about VCs, look them up on LinkedIn, look them up, uh, by the way, LinkedIn, best um, CRM system I ever had, or look them up on, uh, on uh, look, up, look their websites, you know, or go to Crunchbase or go to Pitchbook or something like that, they're not hiding. Here you go. What part of the process do you bring a lawyer to a VC meeting, right? You know what they say, you don't bring a knife to a gunfight. Um, so if you're going to, if you're going to show when they bring their lawyer, you bring your lawyer. Uh, don't do that until they do. Okay, I'm one of the few lawyers that's going to tell you this. He's going to tell you not to have a lawyer, but you can have a lawyer in the background, but you don't show up to a meeting un with a lawyer unannounced. I've been put in that position a few times. It's very awkward. You know, it's unfortunate. You know, the VCs don't like it. They think that you're, you know, you, you know, you brought a lawyer. Are you planning on suing me already? That kind of thing. You know, plus it's just, it's bad form. You don't bring a lawyer to the VC meeting. I know other lawyers are going to disagree with me, but I'm just telling you, don't do it. Um, however, um, there will come a point where you have to sit down and have a negotiation, but, but only when they have their lawyer. You just make sure everybody knows that it's lawyer to lawyer. And by the way, let me, um, let me add to that. Um, and this is going to be hard for you to hear, okay? But you want as much of this negotiation to be lawyer to lawyer as possible. And again, other lawyers are going to disagree with me. They're going to say, oh, no, lawyers just argue all the time. No, we don't. Not if we know what we're doing. Not if we've done this before. We know what the market is. We know where you're going to end up. Let's just cut to the chase. Let us handle it. Why do I say that? Because I've been on these conference calls where you got 10 business people and two lawyers and uh, the business people want to posture and ask questions that don't need to be asked for an hour and you get to the hour and nothing's accomplished. So that's just my little kind of way that I like to do things. You need the business people at the front end to define the business terms. But once that's done, once that term sheet's done, let the lawyers handle it. All right, we talked about you two. What type of agreements should you have with friends and family based funding? Well, thank you. You should have an agreement. You're way ahead of the game knowing you should have an agreement. A lot of these companies go into this without an agreement. Um, so um, uh, what type of agreement should it be? It should be a simple agreement for future equity that I just described, uh, which I also have just now tonight termed the wimpy safe. Uh, it should also, or it could be a convertible debt, which I hope you don't use anymore. It should almost always be a simple agreement for future equity. And that is you give me your money now, uh, I'm going to give you stock later at some value to be determined without interest. And if I don't raise any money, you don't get your money back. As odd as that sounds, that is the standard. And your friends and family, they're not expecting to get any money back anyway. They should be happy to get that. All right, let me continue here. Uh, shared equity financing deals. 40, um, no, there's, not, there's a complicated question <laughs> about um, a shared equity financing deal where um, here's how it works. Let me just, rather than try to interpret the question, here's how dilution works, right? You have a valuation. Your company is worth, the VC is going to give you a valuation. They're going to say, we're going to invest in your company 
at a valuation of $8 million, okay? They probably mean pre-money. What does that mean? It means it's $8 million before they put their money in. So I'm going to give you $2 million on a pre-money valuation. That means I, the VC, will own $2 million out of $10 million. Your $8 million plus my two, that's 10. I own two out of 10, I own 20%. Okay, that's an $8 million. That's a pre-money valuation. We get an option pool involved, it gets more complicated, right? I'm going to show you this next time we do this program. But that's the idea, all right? Next round, we make a pancake out of it. We start all over. The next VC comes along and they say, oh, your valuation is now why? $20 million in pre-money, and I'm going to give you $4 million on a 20. That means I have four out of 24 million posts, right? So that's how it's done. You don't hardwire it. You don't say you're going to have 40% now and 20% later, 10% later. You just can't do it. You can't do it. The valuation, you don't know what it's going to be when you get there. I understand where you're going with this. You know, it's kind of just as an overall philosophy. I see entrepreneurs trying to hardwire stuff, you know, but just forget it. It, it all gets that. Like I say, that economic debt gets reshuffled every time around. Is securing IP worth the cost? Yes, it is. Get patents. It is definitely worth the cost. I'm not just saying that because I'm a lawyer. I'm saying that because it, well, it can't be junk patents, first of all. If they're good patents, you know, they are valuable. VCs love them. They keep competitors out of the market. It's a legal monopoly. Where else can you get a legal monopoly? Um, yeah, please get the patents. How do you value a company depending on patents? If you, if you want to email me and if you're really interested and if you remind me, I've got a memo I prepared several years ago. I counted 30 different ways that VCs value companies. Several of them are, are a function of how many patents and how good the patents are. That is one way that VCs might value you. We'll do valuation next time I talk. It's too big a topic. Do I have names of the problematic VCs? Yes, I do. I'm not going to tell you who they are, though, because I don't want to get sued either. Let's see. I've been self-invested in VC for a clinical study. Uh, will this be difficult for the VC invest in? Okay, that's a bigger question. Will a VC invest in something that you're, okay, clinical study, that means you're in pharma or bio. You're not going to have revenue for a long time. You're not going to have, you're, you're going to exit without ever having revenue. What VC would invest in that? I know that's what you're thinking. They will. They're out there. They're not concerned about revenue. They're concerned about exit value. And big pharma or big bio is going to buy you uh, even though you have no revenue. So uh, don't worry about that. So in your world, traction does not mean revenue. Traction means something completely different. It means clinical studies. It means FDA approvals, et cetera. Okay, who do we use for background checks? Um, <laughs> if somebody asked me a question like that, I kind of wonder what they're worried about. You can assume that they're going to find out. So let me just put it that way. You, they, use very, they use real private investigators. You know, not the FBI, okay, you know, but they do use, you know, people that are going to look and they're going to find. This is the information age. Uh, but you'd be surprised what I can find out about you. I got Nexus Lexus. Um, here's a good one. I talked to a lawyer about a FinTech product. Should I get him to sign a confidentiality agreement? Uh, it's not necessary. Most of them won't do it. Um, our ethical obligations to keep your secrets confidential are um, far more uh, stringent than any confidentiality agreement you could come up with. That's, reason, that's my reason. Uh, my friend Adeo Rossi over at Founders Institute, he has another reason. His reason is nobody's going to steal your crappy idea. I didn't say that. He did. Okay. Any thoughts on Founders Institute? Yeah, I like those guys. That was coincidental. Uh, thanks, Roger. This helps. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, does it help to have a safe note when you're going for fundraising with a VC? Yes, but here, remember what I said earlier, do a spreadsheet, know what you've given away. Okay, let's see. What else we got here? Do VCs invest in companies that the founder plans to sell in the future? I would say that's pretty much all they invest in. They want to get their money out of it. Think about this for a minute. How The VC is not investing in you because they want to save the world like you do. I don't care what they tell you. They invest in you because they want you to make them rich, right? They want to make money. How are they going to make money off you? It's not going to be on dividends. I can't remember seeing a startup company pay dividends, right? Uh, it's not going to be on your revenue. It's going to be on the exit, IPO or M&A exit. These days, it's usually an M&A. I know we're at the end, but I got to go back and promise somebody I would pick up this question that I skipped. How much ownership? This is the last question. Should you give the two founders 
co-founders, I built it. I got co-founders. How much ownership should I give them? Um, one guy's really technical. One guy's a really good salesman. The other guy, I'm going to give 50% to all to each of them, 50% to the technical, 50% to the marketing and 50% to the business guy. Good idea. I, I advise that. That's why you got to get a training on Excel guys. Um, here's what you do. Uh, we do a whole program on this. Unfortunately, I know that's my answer for everything, but the, the, the top line is that there are a lot of different ways to value co-founders contributions. Um, I can give you a lot of different ways to do that. I can tell you what the ways are. I can tell you the pros and cons. And I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'll throw this in for a bonus. I'm going to help you do that. I'm going to sit down. I'm going to talk with you about why it is that maybe the slicing pie model is right for you or the dynamic split model or the subjective um, or, uh, or even a grunt fund. You know, there's a lot of different models out there. Uh, we, do, we do quite a bit of commentary on it. You can see it on my YouTube channel. All righty, with that, uh, you won't believe it. It's like 100 degrees right now here in Palo Alto in my office. There's fires up in the mountains. It's smoky downtown. Um, there's viruses out on the street, except at DMV. They don't hang out there. Um, but um, it's crazy times, folks. But the VCs are still investing. So, you know, go in and negotiate them, negotiate with them and uh, get that money. Back to you, Rob. That was a lot of good information. Roger, thanks for spending time with us and sharing your expertise. Audience members, thanks for tuning in and asking great questions. See you next time.